Good morning. Pastor Jacobson here with another morning devotion for your day, your afternoon, your evening, whichever applies to you, because I know we have people watching these at so many different times of day. I'm glad you're able to tune in whenever it may be. Um, today, we're going into Matthew chapter 15. Um, we've already done the first half of Matthew 15, but today we get to go into the second half. This second half um, can get people riled up. I know uh, sometimes I get a lot of questions on is Jesus being mean, what's going on. Uh, we, we've talked about that in a former uh, morning devotion. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about it today, but what I really want to get to is connecting this first half to the second half. So if you remember, just kind of recapping where we've been, last time Monday, because yesterday I had a meeting, but on Monday we talked about the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. That on one side, you can keep the law by doing what the law says on the surface. But what was the intention of the law in the first place? Was it to... Um, you know, was it to get you just to keep the basics or was there more to it? This is why, especially in the Lutheran church, when we give explanations to Luther's, um, uh, Luther's explanations on the commandments, we talk both about what we should not do, thou shall not, but also the flip side, what we should do, right? So it's kind of the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Today, we're going to see somebody who understands the spirit of the law, unlike the Pharisees. So once we put these two uh, groups, I'm sorry, I completely shook my desk there. Once we put these two groups, this, this Pharisee group that wants to keep the um, letter of the law and even make some laws that they can keep up with, versus this woman who understands the spirit of the law, I think we understand this chapter a little bit better. So that's what we're going to do today. We also have a viewer question. So every now and then I do get questions sent via Facebook or email or something. And people say, hey, could you address this at some point in morning devotion? So I'll take a little bit of time to do that today. So let's catch up with good mornings. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Diane and Connie and Shirley, Katie, Glenn. Uh, it's good to see you all here this morning. We are going to start Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Matthew 15, verse 21, if you're following along in your Bibles, or as always, you can hear me read it and uh, follow along that way as well. All right. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So they're way north in the kingdom of Israel. This would have been part of the Roman province of Syria. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Okay, a couple things. They're in the way north of Israel and kind of modern day Lebanon is kind of the idea of where you're at. You're a northern Israel, Lebanon area. And you have a Canaanite who's from way down by what we know now as the Gaza Strip. Nothing seems to be adding up. Why is this woman way up there? Why do they know she's a Canaanite woman? And beyond that, she seems to be so far from home chasing after Jesus because she knows her daughter to be sick and oppressed by a demon. She knows this is not some sort of normal sickness. Again, a lot of people nowadays try to make demon possession some sort of you know, schizophrenia or something like that. But the people back then knew of those diseases, and they knew of things that weren't those diseases. We have to understand they're not dumb. We keep trying to play them off like, oh, they don't have modern medical science, and yet they had so many things that we don't even understand or just recently have come to understand. By the way, in the ancient world, they had cataract surgery. Granted, without anesthesia, that would be kind of freaky, but they had it. They had a lot of things that we haven't really gotten back to for, except for the last hundred years. We lost the ability to do it. So let's give them more credit uh, than being some sort of backwater people. She knows what's going on. And so what has she done? She's gone to the only person who can do anything about it. I am sure she just tried everything that she could possibly think of. 
if you had a son or daughter or really any relative, especially one that's close to you, that was suffering in any way, you know that you will go to any extent to figure out how to help them. Even if it wasn't something demon possession, right? You might very well, uh, you know, take your loved one to multiple doctors, maybe across multiple state lines. You might uh, try anything and everything you could think of. So this woman has most likely done all of that. And now she goes to the only one she thinks and knows we're going to find out who can help her. So let's keep going. But Jesus, but he, did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right. So Jesus is starting to put something to works in the play. It sounds very mean but perhaps there's more going on than what we realize. First and foremost, yes, Jesus was sent, at least initially, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and they will reject him. That's what we're going to see towards the end of the gospel. They will be the ones that say, hey, Caesar's our king. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify Jesus. There'll be this flip. The Gospel of John says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But at least initially, he is there with his people. So he's not said anything wrong. The second thing is, is this, this, the disciples are getting annoyed. They are like, hey, Jesus, she's been following around. She's starting to get annoying. Who knows how long she's been following them at this point. And if you're not going to say anything, that's fine. But at least, you know, have the common courtesy to send her away. So what's going on? Keep going. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. Now I want to take this word knelt. Maybe you have a different translation. In the Greek, it's proskuneo, which means to bow before. It means to worship. This is the same word that you use in worship. And it's always the same posture. It's this bowing. The idea behind it is a submission to something that is greater than you. Okay. So she goes, and yes, she kneels. That's the physical act. But behind the Greek word, the mindset is she's worshiping. She's laying herself humbly before God because she knows there's no one else who can help her. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, you have to understand also that dogs are not kept as household pets in the ancient world. They might stick around your family. You might call them your dog or something, but they're more kind of our idea of the farm dog out here in the country. It's not Fido that you leave inside. He kind of is around and you kind of play fetch with him every now and then, but really they're there to chase off rodents, eat things. You know that dogs put all sorts of nasty things in their mouths, all these type of things, and they kind of clean up human waste laying around. They're not clean animals, even by Jewish law. So Jesus, in essence, has called her exactly what she is as long as she's not part of the people of Israel, right? She's not part of the party of circumcision. She does not worship at the temple. She does not do any of these things. She's a Canaanite. And yet something has changed about this Canaanite. Yes, yeah, she hasn't done any of the temple worship She's probably not connected to anybody that's in the circumcision party. She's not connected to any of those things, any of the law of God. And yet there's some sort of faith that Jesus can do something for her. So you see what Jesus has done here. He has indeed claimed the truth, right? She's a dog. She's outside of the realm of grace, at least as the way we're looking at it by the law, the letter of the law. And look what she does. She says, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Again, dogs are the ancient vacuum cleaner, right? So here, that's exactly what she's doing. She's agreeing with Jesus. She understands the spirit of the law that there's nothing at all that she can do 
to keep the law perfectly and find some sort of good grace with God so that her child may be healed. She realizes none of it has worked. No matter what she's tried, no matter what she's done, she's going to have to seek someone who can do it for her. And so in this miraculous show of faith, she agrees. That's what faith does. Faith looks at the facts of what the scriptures tell us about ourselves and agrees with it even when it hurts. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. Faith looks at the facts of what the scriptures tell us about ourselves and agrees with it even when it hurts. This is incredibly difficult to do. Because, of course, we kind of have those human prides within ourselves. Well, I'm not really that bad. Well, pastor, is it really bad that X, Y, and Z is happening? And the case in point is, yes, it is. Because all sin leads to hurt, sacrifice, and death. So, yes, it really is that bad. Now, sometimes we as pastors have to realize, well, some, a lot of times we have to confront it. And this can make people really upset, right? You may have seen it in church where people are very upset because of um, being confronted with a sin. And it can make connections and families go wrong. It could do all sorts of things. Could sometimes maybe uh, we as pastors do a better job of confronting it? Yes, there's all sorts of things that go into this. But at the end of the time, at the end of the day, you realize that a lot of times when we are actually called out for our sins, and we don't like it, ooh, right? But here, look, instead of fighting with Jesus and calling him out and trying to, you know, in our modern world, cancel Jesus for being mean or having wrong thought or not being woke enough or any of these fun things, right? She just says, yes, Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She still holds out Even in her agreeing, yes, I am a dirty, rotten sinner. I'm a horrible person, all these. But you know what? I still get some of the crumbs too. That's what faith does. Then Jesus answered her, a woman, and I want to remember, in the ancient world, women don't always have the best of standings, right? We know this, historically speaking, and all sorts of things. And the fact that a woman Great is your faith. Jesus takes the time in the ancient world to deal with this woman and claim that even she, who's outside of the people of Israel, has greater faith in conjunction with those Pharisees we heard about on Monday. Be it done for you as you desire, and her daughter was healed instantly. Even if she had not received what she wanted, I have a very good feeling because of how Jesus describes her faith she would have kept beating on God's door. She would have kept following Jesus. She would have kept pleading. She would have kept believing. Because that's what faith does. All right. There's a lot of cool stuff that we could go in. I have a sermon on it back there if you want to go up to our YouTube channel and figure out some of that. And there'll probably be more because I love preaching on this section. But hopefully that's enough for you for right now. Let's move on. Um, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And when he went up on the mountain and sat down there, and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, many others, and they put them at his feet, and he healed them. All people, by the way, who cannot help themselves, and no one else has been able to help. We are seeing the great reversal. We're seeing creation be set anew. That's what Jesus is showing, that the people who can't help themselves now have an advocate, now have somebody who is doing something for them. And more than just healing them, there is faith because they are coming to him. The bigger show is that even the most weak, lost, and broken have salvation. Keep going. So the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled heal, healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. The crowds wondered. Well, wondered about what? Could this be the Messiah? 
And it's so funny that they see all these things happening and they know it's all happening and yet there's always these doubts. And we're gonna talk about the doubts here in just a second because they're coming up. 32, then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days. Whenever you see three days, start thinking death, resurrection, right? And have nothing to eat, okay? Now, the human body can go for a very long time without eating, right? We'll address that some other time. But Jesus says, I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. He wants to provide for them. And the disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? Now, wait a minute, pastor, you're saying, didn't we just hear this story? We did. Back in chapter 14, Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children. Huh. I would venture a guess that Jesus didn't just feed, feed the crowds one, two, three, four times. My guess is this happened often. We get a few of them recorded. But I love how Matthew closes this section out with another feeding. Keep going. Uh, and Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven and a few small fish. Man, doesn't that sound familiar? It's like these guys live on bread and fish because they had five uh, loaves in the last section and the fish as well. Now notice they say small fish this time. They're like, uh, but there's something about their doubting. They just saw Jesus feed everyone. Who knows? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's only a chapter. Might have been just last week, for all we know. Could have been longer. That's a possibility. They, um, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Again, that same pattern of language that we hear on Sunday in the Lord's Supper, that Jesus took, he broke, or he blessed, he broke, he gave, and then he said, this is my body. It's a training. It's a, it's a kind of pattern of training for the disciples. It's not the Lord's Supper yet, but it's almost as if the disciples are starting to learn what their marching orders are going to be. You are going to give out the things that I give to the people. So there's this constant theme. But notice they doubted. They're like, oh, Jesus, uh, what are we going to do about feeding all these people? And we got a few loaves of bread and fish. The humanity is so often into this, right? We understand who Jesus is, and there's always this maybe doubt, maybe this kind of push pull, right? Verse 37. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadha. Okay. So again, Jesus does this feeding again, even when there seems to be doubts and all these things. So you have this parallel. You have a couple parallels going on here. On the one hand, Monday, we saw the parallel of the, the Pharisees. That's the first bar of the parallel. That they want to keep the letter of the law and they make all sorts of laws to keep them on the straight and narrow. And then you have the f faith of this Canaanite woman who should not be part of this story, but is. And then kind of bracketing it, you have these people who are wondering, is this Jesus? Yes, he's given miracles, but is it Jesus? Back and forth. This is kind of the tension of our life. On the one hand, we try to set up rules or think of God's law and say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep it. And we go for it, and maybe we do well for a little while, and we should always try, but we learn that we don't keep it very well. And then we're confronted with the reality of not keeping it very well. Do we act as the Canaanite woman, saying, man, okay, I'm a sinner, and I need to fix that. I need to, need to get over that. But at least Jesus, by faith, loves me. And then we go right back into, but am I forgiven? It's a cyclical pattern. And again, this is why church 
devotions, time together as brothers and sisters in Christ is so important. And I know during COVID-19 time, we have lost a lot of it. I know that maybe we were losing a lot of it even before that time because families are less and less likely to attend church or attend church anything. But it's so important because we are constantly struggling with this. And the cycle can be broken by forgetting that we are forgiven. What ends up happening then is you end up back at the beginning with that pharisaical side. Well, I'm pretty good. I'm doing pretty good with the law. You know, at least I don't cheat on my wife or at least I don't murder people or at least I don't do X, Y, Z, right? You're back with the Pharisees, but the pattern has to continue to unravel. It's not going to continue to unravel unless we're hearing, being reminded, constantly diving back into this thing. If it's not held out there, as I kind of joked on Monday, it's like God knows that we need to be reminded about every six to seven days. Haha, ha, church, right? You're, you'll end up staying in that legalistic letter of the law cycle. I've seen it happen too many times for it to be just a um, coincidence. I've seen it happen almost every time when people break out of that cycle. Okay, so those are some thoughts for your day, right? I hope that kind of helps you think through, especially the story of the Canaanite woman. You know, again, is Jesus being mean? We, the whole concept of mean in 2021 is crazy, okay? Um, I think that we are kind of maybe coddled just a little bit with our concept of mean and right and all these type of things because other cultures in this world don't consider calling a spade a spade a bad thing. You go to uh, especially Eastern cultures and stuff, they will just simply tell you how it is. And that's just how it is. And everybody's used to that. It might start fights at t from time to time, but they're they're not going to kind of do, you know, I, I kind of joke about the Minnesota nice thing where they never bring up, you know, what might be a little bit uncomfortable or awkward. That's the culture. We need to stop trying to put our culture, our ideas of nice and kind and not, not right and all those things on top of the Bible because our culture is very different in that sense. So no, I don't think Jesus is being mean. I think he's trying to draw out the story so that we can see where faith lands. That even when faith encounters its own sin and its own identity as uh, somebody who's a dog not worth the, the mercy and grace of God, only then can it agree and lay hold of what Jesus has indeed given us, saying, I can't do it, Lord, help me. So hopefully that helps you think about that a little differently. Okay, so we still got a little bit of time here. Um, I did get a viewer question. Let me bring it up here. Give me just a second, guys. Um, so this person uh, sent it in via YouTube. Uh, from one of have, having watched one of the YouTube uh, morning devotions that was put up and asked the question about fasting, which we talked about in Matthew chapter six, says, Dear Pastor Jacobson, I've been looking into this concept of fasting more. I had never considered it as part of a Christian life until your devotion on Matthew chapter six. Could you talk a little bit more about um, the how and the whys and the winds of doing, how wise winds, winds of doing uh, fasting, especially during this Lenten season. Thank you, Redhead45. Okay. Well, Redhead45, I'm assuming, by the way, that sh that um, name probably belongs to a girl. I'm not sure. But so if I get it wrong, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, but as far as fasting is concerned, there's a lot, of, there's really no wrong way to go about it. And there's really kind of almost no right way to go about it, okay? So it's kind of what you want to do. It is a good discipline to take up. But again, what I always encourage people to do it is to try to extricate it a little bit from these kind of modern, you know, intermittent fasting, weight loss things. And there's a lot of great research that it is very good for that and longevity and all those things. And you can look all that up, YouTube, all sorts of places. There's good information on it. What I would encourage you to look into 
is fasting from a spiritual standpoint. Yes, it will have health benefits. It will have all those other things, and that's cool too. Uh, but that's kind of like the secondary. So um, how about I explain it the way I do it, especially coming into Lent, okay? So um, what I will do, and it'll start on Ash Wednesday. So the Tuesday before what's known as Fat Tuesday, uh, you eat, the idea is you have a blowout, right? You clean everything out of the pantry, you eat everything. I don't do that because I would be sick. Um, so I eat normal Tuesday, all those things. I might have a bigger meal. And then let's say I'm done eating at dinner. So around six o'clock, seven o'clock, whatever time that might be for you. Um, or supper for, for you guys out here in Minnesota, Iowa, right? So I'm done. And then I will wait to eat again until um, either the same time the next day. So that would be 24 hours. Or even later, a lot of times because I don't like preaching after I've eaten, it just doesn't work out very well. So I might wait until after our Ash Wednesday service. Um, so that's me. I normally eat at least one meal a day when I do a fast at the very end of the day. And I try to do this twice a week through the season of Lent. And I do it even more intensely during Holy Week. That's me. And I have experience doing that you might not be able to make it that long. Maybe if you have experience doing, you know, intermittent fasting, you might very well be able to do a 24-hour fast. Um, this year, I am going to try something a little different. I might go for 48 hours. Um, but there's a spiritual side of it behind it, right? The idea is not to uh, as Jesus says in Matthew 6, for everybody else to see your fast, so to see how miserable you are. When I do these things, I go, I, I do my normal schedule. I do everything the way I, I would normally do it. I get up early in the morning. I work out still intense. I do my job, be a father, husband, all those things. I don't change. I don't just kind of mope around. The one thing I do 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 uh, so the one thing I do is I take up a devotion, a book of the Bible to study through Lent, normally a longer book, you know, not like Philippians, but maybe I take up Jeremiah or Ezekiel. Maybe I take up uh, one of the Gospels, the book of Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and I spend some time each day, especially on my fasting days, to study those things, right? Because I'm not having lunch. What should I do? So this year, I'm going to go back. I've already read this before, but it's just so good. I'm going to go back over it. Um, the Great Works of God. Let's get that in here. Uh, by Valerius Herberger. It's translated. He was a German pastor from back, I believe, in the 1600s. But man, guys, he's just really good with how he lays out things. And he goes through the book of Genesis in particular. He has two volumes. They have a third volume in translation about the book of the Exodus. Maybe one day I'll get to that, but I'm going to go back through this one this year. So I'll spend some time reading. But more than just reading, the other thing that I do personally is I also take the time. You're going to see all my, my flags on here. Sorry, I just reuse these things. Um, I take the time to get a notebook, uh, something kind of nice, hardcover, um, to journal and record what I'm reading right? Maybe I, I add prayers to that or something, you know, I write those out as well, but it gives me a way to engage the, with the devotion I'm reading a little bit deeper. I would encourage you to do something similar. No matter what your pattern is for fasting, that's kind of something that you're going to figure out on your own. Um, what I would recommend though is with it is conjoining it with a a spiritual devotional book or something. If you have questions, send me some, send me a question. I can point you to re resources. And I always recommend too that you try some Christian spiritual resources that are a little bit above your head. Uh, so, for example, if you're really used to reading uh, something like Max Lucado or somebody like that, why don't you ratchet it up a bit? It's season of Lent, right? This is a great season to get a little deeper to kind of reflect a little deeper on things. So you might try Valerius Herberger. You might try um, 
Paul or Johann Gerhardt. I'm just looking at the books above my head. Maybe you try something from Martin Luther. Uh, maybe you try something from the large catechism. Hey, maybe you knew the small catechism, you try the large catechism. Something easy to kind of go through. Um, but it, something that kind of ratchets it up and challenges you a little bit more than maybe what you're used to. If you've done nothing, well, maybe just pick up a book of the Bible and start, you know, a chapter a day or something like that. So that would be my recommendation for you. Um, the when, that's going to depend on you. Uh, as I said, I go twice a week doing the way that I just described with kind of one meal af after a 24-hour fast. Uh, the reason for that is I'm incredibly physically active. I work out every morning, and I also train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu two to three times a week. So it would be very hard on me from a caloric standpoint to, to do much more than that. Some people do more, and that's fine too. But listen to your body. Make sure you don't put any stress. I never recommend fasting for anybody who has an eating disorder. So if you have a history of bulimia or any of uh, anorexia or any of those things, this is not for you. If you're pregnant or nursing, this is not for you. If you have a medical condition uh, that, would, that would be exasper exacerbated by this, then it's not for you either. Try instead taking up a devotional life, a prayer life, something of like that during the season of Lent. But assuming that you're healthy and all those good things, give it a shot, see what you think, go slow. You know, maybe you take one day, I'm just gonna do 12 hours, and that's easy. Stop eating at night, go to bed, wake up, start eating at whatever time you stop that night, right? For the morning. Uh, maybe you go 24 hours. Maybe you do 24 hours and say, oh, that was enough, maybe I only do that once a week. I, whatever goes for you. But make sure that we keep it focused, spiritually speaking, um, not just for health benefits. There are health benefits. I do it often, um, but I always combine it with a devotional thing, okay? So hopefully that answers your question. If you have more, I can message back and forth with you, but I figured if somebody took the time to message me about it, other people were thinking about it. So that's why I took the time to address it in morning devotions. So let me catch up here. Good morning, LaVon and Arliss, Sue. Good morning, Tiffany. Hey, Angela. Hey, Mom. All right. Um, if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and put those down below. Um, in our prayers today, I finally got it all sorted out. My list was getting a little bit full. So now I kind of got it sorted out. I did confirm that Pastor Simonson down at Spirit Lake does indeed have COVID-19. So we have him on our prayer list. Uh, the Nunez family has requested our prayers for just things going on in their life at this time, so we will pray for them. Um, and then everybody else that we have been having on our prayer list, list is still on there, okay? So I'll give a little bit of time here. Whoa. Give a little bit of time here for uh, prayer requests or questions, anything like that. You can put those in. Um, tomorrow at 9, we'll have morning devotions. I might not be able to see who's on. I am going to be trying to run it through our YOLO box and our camera that we have upstairs. And the reason for that is because I'm trying to do some test uploading straight from that to YouTube. I'm trying to see if I can bypass having to download everything on my computer and then back up. It's just taking too much, too much memory. Um, and if I can fix that, then I at least can get morning devotions back up going, but it might ch change how we interact, okay? So if I'm not saying hi or good morning to you in the morning, uh, probably because I can't see you. I still should be live, just like we would have anything else live, but it might be just a little different. It's seriously one test day. That's how it's going to work. Okay, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that although we are indeed dirty, rotten sinners. And we know this by faith, that you still have sent your son to give his life as the ransom for our sins. That no matter where we have been, there's still mercy and grace and forgiveness in your son. Father, we ask that you continue to be with those in need of our prayers for those recovering from ailments and surgeries, especially from t for Tim and Jody and Roger. Be with Pastor Simonson as he 
continues to fight the coronavirus at this time and in due time as he recovers from it, that he would be given a full recovery. Father, we pray that you be with the Nunez family, that no matter what they go through this day or the next, or in the weeks and months to come, you would give them patience and grace that only you can give. Father, we also ask that you continue to be with the men and women of our police forces and armed forces, especially those who continue to be deployed, whether in our own nation now or around the world. Keep them safe and bring them back to their families in safety. Be with this, be this day with Kurt and Corey and Roger and Tyler and keep them in your grace. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, Alina Health Clinic, Buffalo, Minnesota, involved in the shooting tragedy. Okay, I had not heard about that, Arla, so I'll have to look that up, but let's go ahead and um, pray uh, for them real quick as well. Heavenly Father, for reasons that we do not know, we are visited once again in our nation and especially in our state of Minnesota with another tragedy of violence. You have never promised that we would go without violence in our world. Indeed, you have always told us that it would continue until the last day. Be with those who have now suffered violence and buffalo be with those who mourn the loss of loved ones and those who work to restore and establish peace once again. Use us as your hands and feet as we continue to care and love for our neighbors in need. Although we know that violence and hatred and bloodshed will never depart from us on this side of heaven, Help us to always trust that in you, we know it's not the end. And that no matter how much Satan and evil and the demonic forces of this world might try, they will never overcome the truth and goodness and mercy of your son. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so yeah, I will have to look into that there, Arliss. Uh, thank you for letting me know. I haven't really been on news or anything for a while, so I will give that a, a check um, in just a minute. So let me add that to my uh, notepad here. All right. God's blessings on your day. Hope to see you tomorrow at 9.